Morris When I step up on a step up on a summer What is up, ladies and gentlemen? We are back. We are live. The Freight Coach Morning Show every single weekday, 8.30 a.m. Pacific, 10.30 Central. The top transportation morning show to break down three industry articles. But before we break down any articles today, we got my friend Stacy here. Stacy, what's up? How are you? Hello. Hello. B-Hub. I'm great. How are you, Chris? I'm doing fantastic. We're we're here to have you know again put a face behind V Hub mm-hmm. and then have hear it directly from them. I sit up here and talk about asset reallocation. I sit here and talk about why, as a broker or a carrier alike, we need capacity. We and this is a solution out there for you. Whether you have cross border freight, power only freight, you're looking to reposition long term rentals, whatever that looks like. This is what they're here for with that. So, Stacy, kind of talk about this. I'm going to pull up my my stream here. Uh, we got the, these trailers out there. So like, what does it mean when you see like, you know, you get 600 bucks right here and then it goes to multiple locations throughout Canada? Yes. So um, so this is uh, a VHub on our VHub application on the platform. This is what we currently have available amongst other repositioning. So right now uh, we have trailers, empty loadouts that are in, you know, the Wilmington, Chicago area that need to go cross border. So we have some that need to go to Montreal, to Mississauga, out west to the Western provinces, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba. So essentially, you'll see there's a price there. And that is the price that is actually paid to our carriers. So, you know, Chris, like you've been talking about with the cost of fuel, if that price is not, you know, you need more due to the high fuel cost, you can actually make an offer on VHUB if you know you need to cover the cost of fuel or whatever it may be. Yeah. So that price that is there um, is negotiable. So if the owner Ooh. is saying, yeah, no problem, we could do it for what the price that's on the platform is $600. We could do it for 800. There you go. Yeah. You have it. And, and and that's exactly it guys. So that's on top of the freight that you book to put in there as well. So for the carriers exactly. that are out there listening to that, you get paid $600 to reposition it on top of the freight that you could have to go in and to run up there. Cause you know, as you guys can see here with the last graphic, this one shows those round trips that we're talking about. So you can power only up there into Canada. So like, what, what about the cross border uh, section of this, Stacy? Do you have any information to kind of divulge with that? Yes. So, you know, V hub, we are, we are improving. So we get a lot of feedback from our members right now saying, Hey, yeah. this is what we need. This is an issue that we're seeing. Um, so we have a great development team and we work with that. So what we've been seeing recently is I don't have access to go into Canada. Yeah. How do we resolve that? So with research and, you know, different resources, you, you can submit a application to the Canadian border and I, I've done it. I've seen it firsthand. You get a response within 24 hours where you get a four digit carrier code. So nice. once you have that carrier code, you are you're good to cross the border. You are, you can cross the border and go into Canada, get reposition that trailer and then come back with another trailer that we have available in the Montreal area, in the Mississauga, Toronto, uh, the GTA and come back down into the U S. So it's not as complicated as it seems with, you know, all that information you see, and this is what you need. It's quite simple. No, definitely. That's what it's all about. We got we have resources for you if you guys need this. And again, here's some of those re- one-way repositionings that are out there. You guys out of you know Utah and then Glade Spring, Virginia, going up into Canada. Again, you guys you get paid eighteen fifty to move it on top of the freight that you book in it as well. So, Stacy, thanks for kind of popping in this morning. Yeah. You guys reach out to her. All right, if you guys have any questions about V Hub, reach out to Stacy. She can help you out. And uh, she, she's going to be a reoccurring thing. You know, we're looking uh, once a week, her and some of the other VHub team are going to be a part of this to kind of break this down and other scenarios down that yeah. they're going to have for you guys to utilize. Again, asset reallocation is where it's at. Stacey, how can anybody find you? Um, you can shoot me an email, um, LinkedIn as well. And, you know, one last thing I like to add is all about creativity. So yeah. if you if your end game is, you know, somewhere in Canada, like Western provinces, we have trailers leaving from the US that need to go into Mississauga and we have trailers in Mississauga needing going to Western provinces. So, you know, it's being creative. That's what we're here for is helping yeah. you find those solutions. So you can reach out to myself. I'm on LinkedIn uh, by text message, by email. 
I'll answer you. I'm happy to, and I'm happy to help. Perfect. Stacy. thank you so much. Reach Thanks out to so her. Much. You guys, as always, V-Hub, thank you for all your support and doing this every single day. So we'll see you tomorrow, Stacy. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye now. All right. I got this very special guest. V Vitaly, you're, that, that's a lie. All right. A, I appreciate you showing up every day, but you have heard of them. Come on. Samantha Bass, good morning. Um, I got a very special guest for you guys here. Boom. Mr. Matt Laird is joining the show today. Matt, what's going on, brother? How are you? Man, it's a good day. It is a good day. Every day is a good day, man. Um, did you see that uh, it's International Road Check Week? I, I don't know if you if you heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. we, uh, we, we luckily haven't been out of service, but we have got several inspections. Luckily, they're giving out a little sticker so that uh, they only get to get you once. So maybe it'll no, save us a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of time tomorrow. No, oh, definitely. And that ends tomorrow, uh, the 19th. You guys, it goes through there. It's wheel end components. Yes, it is Canadian Vitaly. And they're, you know, the GTA Vitaly just loves busting my balls, man, at the end of the day. But hey, I appreciate it. You know, I, I, I when you put yourself out there, man, you got to be open to the criticism, especially from people who you thought were your friends. But <laughs> I'm just playing. V's great. Josh Harrison, what's up? He says he loves Matt Laird. I mean, that's um, great. Dude, so we're at uh, day 28 of the freight coach tally of there being a truck parking issue and bathroom issues that are out there. And again, I'm not going to stop talking about this, you guys, until we see meaningful change out there. And that's going to come from the drivers, you know, because again, you send me stuff, other drivers send me stuff all the time of facilities across the nation that are, are doing this. And my guest yesterday, Dave Abels, I mean, he's the COO of, of, of a carrier. He's been in this industry for a long time. He said it best. He's like, if your drivers are giving you this feedback and you're not doing anything with it, that's a problem. Yeah, we're we're collecting uh, we're collecting the photos. We're sitting in the photos back with our uh, uh, two hundred and fifty dollar fee to our brokers when we send them uh, with yeah. the photo. Um, it's accessibility charge. Uh, so far, we haven't got paid on any, but at least they're seeing it, right? So, hey, man. I mean, I, I know I know there's brokers out there who love to slip in those little fees of you know if you're. Um, right windshield wiper doesn't work. Uh, it's a $500 rate reduction, all that other bullshit that's out there. Again, read your rate confirmations, you guys, because unfortunately, if you sign it, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. Don't take, don't take legal advice from a, from a guy uh, on, with a mic. Um, also, uh, diesel still fucking staggeringly high. $5.61 a gallon is where it's at this week. Uh, but it is down 0.01%. One yeah, that's a good yeah. savings right there. That's yeah. definitely good. <laughs> um, again, if you guys want to check that out, I pull all that information from the EIA, EIA.gov. Check that out. And yeah, you know, it's uh, Josh Harrison brought, brought up some good points there about some uh, pockets of tightness in the Midwest and spotty capacity in the Southeast. I think a lot of you carriers are going to see some uh, rate reprieve here on the spot market this week and then probably through Memorial Day because that it's those holiday up charges are going to be a thing. And, you know, that again, back to the cyclical nature of freight, you know, it's just give it a couple of weeks sometimes and, you know, it'll balance out and it's just that ebb and the flow of it all. And, you know, I want to, I want to jump right into our first article then Matt, cause we can talk about this with, uh, with fuel and with fuel being what it is and you, how many fleet or how many trucks do you have in your fleet? So we're running about 16, including uh, owner operators right now. Okay, so we got 16 trucks out there. This first article comes from Fleet Owner, um, and that is how to maximize fuel, econ uh, fuel economy. And this was uh, released yesterday. Um, if, fleet manager, if fleet managers are to focus their efforts on uh, any one cost component, it must be fuel. It amazes me that today's technology, Class 8 tractors pulling full loads, can achieve over 10 miles per gallon. Even more amazing is the vast majority of the fleets cannot achieve um, 8 miles per gallon. I mean... So there's trucks. When they say that they can get 10 miles per gallon, is that running empty with no trailer? So there's some guys right now that are actually doing uh, 70, 75,000 miles, and they're they're getting up to 10 miles a gallon. I mean, they're brand new fleets or aerodynamic yeah. trailers. They're they're actually able to do it, and and we're actually making a trade. Uh, hopefully by the end of this week for five uh, five new Class Eight trucks that are supposed to be in that market. So okay. hopefully we can we can prove that. Because uh, but right now we're definitely we're lucky to get the eight miles per gallon with the trucks we're running. Yeah, and you know it goes on to say here about that they're all singing the praises of uh, electric vehicles and the fact that they effectively achieve zero emissions. Um, again, I don't agree with that because of how those batteries are um, 
manufactured and combined again, until there's a battery powered uh, tractor and every excavator and everything else that are along with it, it's not necessarily achieving it. I know it's a great marketing ploy out there, but again, do your research. I'm not here to talk about that. Um, but again, it's uh, the number one factor that controls fuel economy. Uh, fuel economy is, is the driver. So how do you, how do you train your drivers or what information do you provide with them? I know that obviously with, you know, setting a governor out there of, you know, 68 or 70, like whatever that looks like that, that's a thing. So like, what do you do from your perspective? So we don't have our trucks governed at all. Uh, okay. We do, however, request that they uh, run at a certain speed, right. Which is, which is safe. Uh, but basically if you're going downhill, you know, say you're, say you're going on a 2% grade. Well, that's fine. If you get a mile or two over the speed limit, don't ride the brakes. Use that, use that uh, momentum to, to yeah. help got, get you back up the next hill, right? There's another hill. Um, and then also one big thing that we, we really focus on is your idle time. Um, run an APU or, I mean, if it's 69 degrees outside, there's really no reason to run either one, you know, heck, yeah. heck open a window, get some fresh air. Uh, but basically that's it. So we, we do have the, you know, aerodynamic trucks coming in, the skirts on the trailer, but going forward to just driver, you know, we're not in a race and everybody knows that. And, and one thing that we encourage our drivers is that uh, the, the driver gets a percentage of the, uh, of the fuel surcharge. So if the, yeah. the truck is getting better miles per gallon, the fuel surcharge for that load goes down. So the way that the, the fuel surcharge works is you take your constant fuel variable and then you take your current price and you subtract the two and then divide them by your average miles per gallon. So we run that per load. So our, our drivers get more money if they get better fuel miles per gallon. So, uh, it, it helps, it helps everybody remember it. And then, yeah. then we, uh, we have a Slack channel where we're actually sharing our receipts and talking about what we did to get better fuel to mileage where we're adding supplements or whatever. We have more of a game of, Hey, look how good I did this week and not yeah. the owners on my case about getting better fuel mileage. We're actually trying to be more efficient and everybody's on board. Everybody knows that, Hey, if we can't afford to drive these trucks with these fuel prices, nobody gets paid. The more we yeah. save, the more we make. So it's, it's been a real, real good change over the last say hundred days from how fast can we get there to how much can we save? But how do you how do you ensure though that Matt, when diesel levels back out and drops back down to you know whatever it gets down to, how do you ensure that we're we're following that same philosophy in those times to to ensure that we're we're, we're keeping that you know even when we aren't paying five dollars a gallon a gallon or something like that? So well, we're still investing in the more economic hardware, right? The the better yeah. trucks, the APUs. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna have to. Um, I've seen that they have like the uh, the driver copes that, that some some team some companies are using. Um, I think that's great. Uh, once we get to the trucks we want to uh, keep full time, I think we're going to probably invest in something like that. No, definitely. And you know, because you know, it goes on to say about you know compensation and benefits in this article as well. You know, about bringing that you know a half mil uh, a half mile increase in fuel economy and a seventy five thousand mile per year application results in an average savings of thirty five hundred dollars per tractor. Even if we paid the driver twenty percent of the savings performing, uh, we're still saving twenty eight hundred bucks on that. You know, again, so it is. It's like I like the fact that you're doing that. You're giving drivers, hey, like here's a bonus if you do this. We're going to give you, you know, with a fuel surcharge and everything else, less fuel burn and everything. So again, it is. It's like I think there's just so much power in that, Matt, and telling the whole story to the driver and you know to the members of your team at that point. Like, hey, we get this. We get more fuel efficient trucks. We save. We save on that. We pay off our our debts faster, and then boom, we're we're adding to our fleet. Everybody makes more money, and I think that's a. That's a thing out there that, you know, I liked seeing in this article. I thought it was, you know, it's pretty well written overall um, with the fleetowner.com. Again, that was how to maximize fuel economy. Um, Andrew Teal, good morning. Matthew Lesler, good morning. Steven Tidal, Papa Freight, good morning. Nerf, what's up, brother? Good morning. Um, and then, so the second article we're going to jump into is from my friends over at the JOC. Um, it's technology helping shippers track and trim detention time. And before we talk, I, I want I want to hear from you about detention time, Matt, what is oh, it's your favorite conversation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so detention time is not paid. I don't care what the rate con says, you know, said earlier, you're going to, 
you're going to go right off the rate con. Uh, I would say 90% of our our loads go over the, the stated detention, and we still don't get paid for it. But um, we averaged last month uh, five and a half hours um, of load time at every load. And our, our, that's load and unload. So five and a half hours. So if you grab a three or four load or three or four drop load, you could spend a full 24 hours yeah. just sitting there at a shipper receiver. So you've always have to figure that in in your cost. You're not going to get you're not going to get anything from your from your broker or your care your uh, shippers as far as attention if it's within an hour or something. But we're literally at five hours and we didn't receive. We may have got one overnight pay, but but basically you're gonna you're gonna eat that right. So um, our drivers know that's just part of the game, and, and uh, we pay on a scale to where everybody makes well over fifteen dollars an hour for all fourteen hours possibly per day that they can they can do so. The drivers know that if they're going to have to sit, they're just going to have to sit. It stinks. I mean, we have had drivers drop trailers, go to leave and go to truck stops, even though they told them they yeah. couldn't just because there's no access to facilities. There's no food. There's no vending machines. Um, I tell them just drop the trailer, leave that load on location and go wherever you want to go. I mean, they can't, they can't make what, you stay. There. I mean, obviously you're invoicing these brokers for detention. Like what, what, what's the, what's the reason they're telling you that they're not paying you? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely curious because again, like when yeah, I most- speak about a lot of these topics, you guys, I want you to know, I've been that dickhead broker that has had, that has like made up some bullshit about, about it to not pay attention. Yeah. So, so like, mostly, what mostly what we hear is, uh, that, uh, the tracker turned off or the, there was a gap in tracking. So we can't, we can't, uh, we can't do it cause you didn't do tracking or, there's, I mean, we've come up with, we've heard everything. The shipper won't yeah. pay it. The receiver won't pay it. This was first come, first serve, not appointment. It was just a requested time. Uh, we, we've wow. heard a lot. Of it. There's very few yeah. that actually pay it. So that, uh, that, okay. Think, so when it says that they were first come, first serve, it was like, I, I'm going to be honest, Matt, they probably failed on the load the day before. And uh, you're, you're a work in and they're not going to bill their customer because of their fuck up. So brokers, if that's ringing true, you know, again, I'm not holding anything back. I'm here to progress this industry and educate this industry on this shit. And if you're hosing drivers over, and again, I'm not immune from this stuff, you guys. I was like that at one point in my career, but I learned the hard way. And the hard way is going to come from you guys with this when uh, the tr- the driver like Matt or his drivers or another company out there calls that shipper and says, I sat for five hours. Why was I not paid detention? And they tell Matt, we paid the broker detention on that. Um, and then- what are you going to do when your customer calls you with that exact same conversation? Because that's what happened to me. That's when I changed my fucking ways when they're like, we're going to pull this business if this is true. What are you going to do? And that's for what? For a hundred bucks? For 150 bucks? You know, again, you guys, I know that we all like to think that we're, we're, we're fucking tight and like none of this shit's going to affect us ever because we're, we're getting a couple hundred extra dollars here and there from detention and accessorials and stuff, but it will come to bite you in the ass if you're not passing that stuff through. And for all of you who are going to sit here and say, oh, I've never done that before. If you're in leadership right now as a broker and you're curious if that's happening at your desk level, go into some of these Facebook groups. Your fucking rate confirmations are all over the place. That's exactly right. Take that into consideration. So anyways, on to the article, Matt. Sorry, I just had to get that off my fucking chest. <laughs> um, all right. So this one was from the JOC. He goes, it's uh, U.S. shippers and their logistic partners are increasingly turning to technology to reduce driver detention. Um, detention has been a problem, a potential target of U.S. regulators for years. But truck driver delays have been uh, become more disruptive um, before the pandemic. And one difficulty in fighting detention has been multiple uh, potential causes. We pay out more detention time. To drivers and carriers than we used to. Um, Evans Transportation Services told them labor shortages are a huge piece of that, but uh, there's inventory congestion, there's no warehouse space, and these things combine that cause more delays. Um, sometimes a problem, and, and it has a solution. Uh, the number of one issue we're seeing now is language. Um, when a customer near the port will have 200 drivers piled in to check in, they, they all speak. Okay, that, wow. Um, what, what's your initial takeaway from this article? Uh, well, so we're we're 100 percent refrigerated freight, so we don't have we don't have the the same issues as some of these guys do. 
Uh, but yeah, there's definitely the 20 language barriers. We see that a lot. Uh, on the refrigerated freight, I mean, we're basically rental refrigerators, right? So we're going to have to sit there. And most of these shippers will bring in one or two products uh, to the receiver. And we literally have to sit there until they have more trucks to put these loads on because they don't have the refrigerated yeah. capacity at these facilities. So we're basically holding it as a distribution center. And then they'll unload our one truck and put it on 10 trucks, trailers that are sitting there ready to, to ship out. So we're basically rental refrigerators until they feel like letting go of us. So, um, I mean, we see, I mean, Walmart's one of the worst, right? So you pull up to a Walmart, you've got a one hour window. If you're not there within that one hour window, they charge you um, upwards of 10% of the entire load. Uh, mm -hmm. We got hammered for like 1500 bucks one time for a flat tire. Um, and then they won't unload you for until that next round comes. So you could literally sit there yeah. for 24 hours because they don't have another load, another 10 trailers to put your load on. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting, I mean, you know, before, you know, we were hauling chemicals, it was completely different, right? You put it in big tanks and then you leave. Uh, whereas here there's really no, they don't have anywhere to put it. So you couldn't offload it if you wanted to, because it would just go bad. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, the entire supply chain is, three days from running out of food. So that that's the, that's the one reason that I'm not as concerned about the um, detention is because I know that granted they could probably use technology to be better, but that's an insanely difficult task to yeah. bring in, to bring in 15 trucks, rotate it out to 15 other trailers and go to 15 stores yeah. without ever hitting a freezer. So I mean, I'm yeah. not that concerned. If you can do that in four hours and we can get out of there, that's fine. But if you tell us four hours, get us out of there in four so we can plan our next load. No, and absolutely. And I mean, it brought up some some good uh, talking points in there. Again, uh, William Cassidy was the uh, um, author on this article. I thought it was a well-written article. Um, I like reading uh, Bill Cassidy's articles a lot and you know, talking about just the technology that's out there. And again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive proponent of technology. And if there is something out there that could expedite this to reduce dwell time and wait time that's out there. I think it's only a matter of time before it does come to market, but I want to see that happen. But I mean, you are very, very accurate in your assessment there, Matt, of it's complex at times, you know, like 15 trucks coming in, they have to go out on 15 separate trailers and delays are going to be a part of it. But I think that at the end of the day, as long as you're getting compensated for your time, because I don't know of anybody who enjoys sitting at work for free um, ever. So again, that article was from uh, JOC, JOC.com, technology helping shippers track and trim detention time. Um, getting caught up on some comments here. Joshua Harris says, in a looser market, dwell times are up because shippers have the power to pick and choose who they use. So there's less incentive for them to improve shipping practices. Practices Conversely, in tight markets, um, like in 2021, proactively raise their detention compensations uh, to be a preferred shipper. Yeah, there's a lot of ebbs and flows of this stuff. Um, when it comes down to it uh last article is from freight waves and this one is carriers should invest in technology to attract gen z workers experts say what are you doing from your stance matt when it comes down to driver comfort and, and everything else like what is a typical if i was to apply to work for you as a driver what does the setup in your trucks look like right now from a comfort perspective so we don't uh we don't really have the uh, top of the line comfortable trucks. I mean, we we do have you know sleeper trucks. Uh, the ones we're trading into are going to have all of the bells and whistles. You know, the yeah. ones we started with were, uh, you know, we came from hauling chemicals, so we had your you know run of the mill chemical trucks. Those guys weren't on the road all the time. Uh, but now that now that we have drivers that are literally gone for five to six days at a time, we're stepping up to getting them. You know, basically it's a condo on wheels at this point. You know, you yeah. Got, um, the double bunk so they can, you know, we only drive single drivers, but we have, um, double bunk trucks with the huge 80 inch, you know, big sleepers and all this stuff in the new trucks. Uh, as far as the technology, the only thing that we really offer, we do have the, uh, camera systems, the, the, um, artificial intelligence camera system to kind of train the drivers on, you know, following too closely. Yeah. Uh, we also have the, a route um, route software on the Garmin, so we we can dispatch our loads directly to the Garmin. They can just literally accept it and go. Um, and then we have a the one thing that we do is we have a lot of options for fuel stops. So we can do you can do Love's Fine Day TA. Basically, 
we have a lot of options so that we can get them to the cheapest fuel. Yeah. Um, but that's not necessarily a, a good for the company, but that, a good for the employee. That's really good for us because, you know, you could you could essentially save fifty cents a gallon if you, you know over a six hundred mile period if you looked at all of the options. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's good. But yeah, as far as like the, uh, you know, we're not uh, we're not necessarily in the same boat as what this article suggested. Um, we we really like quality trained experienced drivers at this point but we're not definitely not uh we're not turning anyone down that can do the job well yeah it's you know because it, it goes on to talk about how you know it's a hard profession and it's a job of last resort i don't agree that it's a job of last resort for many workers i think there's a lot of people out there that want to get into trucking um and i think i mean dude you're in oklahoma i'm from rural wisconsin like driving trucks where you know that the trades is about what 90% of us get into, you know? And I think that for us, it's what I will say is like, again, marketing to that next generation. And I've spoken about this too. And, you know, I agree with him on this is it's like marketing to the Gen Z and the millennial drivers that are out there to get them attracted into the industry. I get like, yeah, we should definitely highlight the the fact that it is kind of like a, a, a an apartment on wheels at this point, you know, the modern comforts of home and everything. And, you know, when it comes down to like the digital, um, they talk about the digital natives. Uh, Spencer Barkoff from Relay Payments said that uh, you know they expect to have well-developed technology solutions to control us, all aspects of the services. And again, I think like leveraging that information out there to attract that next generation of drivers. And like again, it's like marketing, like social media. I think we have you know because of course they have to throw in there you know that there's an eighty thousand driver shortage. But you're you found an article this morning that there's not a driver shortage. <laughs> it goes back and forth. Whatever fucking gets the most clicks, right? Yeah. Um, okay. And yeah, but I think that again, I will say this, like with what I agree with in this article is the fact that we need to market better as an industry, you know, at, like hands down, we have to change all of that, you know, like just throwing it up there on a indie.com or something like that. Like we I, like, and I love that there's a lot of drivers out there on YouTube and other social media platforms that have pretty big followings and they post the realities of the road. That lifestyle is appealing to a lot of people. It is that nomad lifestyle, the no boss, the fucking out on the open road, being left alone. That is appealing to a lot of people. And as an industry, we got to do a better job of marketing all of that. Um, and again, that one was from Freight Waves. If you guys want to check that out, I put all the links out there on uh, my YouTube channel as well as on my podcast. The audio version of this will be available later on today. Um, but yeah, Matt, what's, uh, you know, we got a couple minutes left here, man. What's what's out there? What what I want to hear the state of the market from you, the person who has drivers, who has trucks, and you're not, you know, just talking for the sake of talking. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, we're, we're reading through these, these clickbait articles, you know, you don't just read the article, the, the title, you keep going through the clickbait, you know, you read all of it and, and everybody's saying the same thing. So you look back and it's the exact same, uh, the same person that wrote the article a couple years ago or a couple months ago that says, you know, Hey, we're, we're going to be in this driver shortage. We're going to be in this truck shortage. We're no way we could catch up on freight. And then all of a sudden, two months later, we're, we're, we're crashing. The world's over. There's no way we're, we're never going to recover from this downturn. Um, everybody's going out of business, the bloodbath. The, the thing that really affects me is that my drivers are reading that stuff. My dispatchers are reading that stuff. My customers are reading that stuff. And, and now everybody thinks that, okay, the rates are down. We basically have the power is what the customers are saying. The drivers are worried. They're like, are we getting laid off today? Um, and it's just basically the fact that nobody had this data to correlate with from years ago. So everything that they're they're publishing now is yeah, based on an idea of what they think this data looked like five years ago or seven years ago. So in the reefer market, if you do a little bit of research, you look back 2017, same thing, come off of a, a, a winter drought, the produce season came in low. Oil price was a little higher. We're basically following the exact same trend line as 2017. And if you look at the number of entrants into the market towards the end of 2017, there's the exact same number of new MC numbers. There's the exact same number of people left. Nothing changed except you had about two months less work. Uh, yeah. Nobody died. Nobody jumped off a cliff. There wasn't any mass suicides. People still ate. People still got food. And nothing changed but there wasn't this much data in the market there wasn't this much 
analytics saying that, hey, we're, we're falling off a cliff. Well, back then yeah. it was just, hey, stay working, keep working, keep your head down, find ways to save a little bit of money, maybe service your trucks instead of running them so hard and, and yeah. everyone was fine. But now there's just no, there, there's no patience. So nobody's really waiting for this. Everybody is all of a sudden, hey, I want to see if I can get some more followers. Hey, I want to see if somebody will sign up for my analytics program. Um, the the market is good. I mean, we have every truck on the road. We have every truck making money. There's money to be made. You have to negotiate a little harder, a little bit less yeah. uh, deadhead miles, uh, a little bit smarter on your fuel surcharges, and everybody's making money. The problem that I'm seeing is that the owner operators are reading the same stuff and they believe it. Yeah. Well, they're taking any load out there because they think, hey, I got to take this load because I may not be able to get another one. Where if they would have waited another hour, they would have actually got something that broke even and made a profit. So the no, thing that really scares me is that so many people are listening to the people that don't really know what they're talking about. So yeah, um, and I say keep your head down, save as much money as you can, get rid of any excess costs, yeah. and keep making miles. No, definitely. And that, and that's your thing is you like, and you've talked about earlier in the episode, and we, you know, we've talked offline about this too. Is it's like, hey, at the end of the day. As a business owner, it is your sole responsibility to know your costs. It's to know your break-even point. But there is so much power in you knowing that. And that's the thing is it's like, you know, I see a lot of the stuff out there as well, Matt. But it's like, if if I was your broker and we were working together and you came to me and said, my break-even on, you know, or my, within my profit margin, I want, you know, this is all hypothetical examples. So don't fucking blow me up and say, oh, that's cheap freight and all that other bullshit. Hypothetically speaking, if Matt comes to me and says, I need $2.80 a mile on this lane, this lane, and this lane. I have 10 trucks in my fleet. I'm going to my customer knowing that I'm bidding RFP freight. I'm bidding semi-contracted lanes and I'm taking that and I'm going to be slightly above spot market rates and I'm going to be below the contracted rate that they need for those shippers that are out there that have that regional freight that aligns with Matt's business. So it's like knowing your costs and giving me, giving me that information and having that conversation with your carrier partners. And isn't again, you guys, I know this is challenging. All right. But as a broker, you need to talk to your carriers about this. If they don't know their costs, I can't help them. But if they know their costs, they know what they need. Take that information and lock in consistent freight with your shippers. Because again, there is a sector of this industry that never gets reported or classified as spot market freight or contracted freight. All right. Please trust me in this. I've moved about six truckloads in my career. So I think I've earned the right to tap. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just fucking with you guys. I've been a broker for a very long time and I've seen this shit so much. There's so much opportunity that's out there that I guarantee if you go to your customer right now and they have a contracted rate at say $3 a mile and you can lock in 280 a mile with them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to pull that fucking lane off of that contract and give it to you. I know because I've seen it happen because I was that broker who came in and had a conversation with one of my carriers on what they need on a lane by lane basis. And I locked in that freight for them. And I know there's brokers out there who are operating in this capacity right now because they're not bitching on social media about stuff because they're executing every single day. They have these conversations. These conversations are tough, you guys, but it can happen. All right. It can happen. This is a partnership. And I know there's a lot of great people in this industry who want to see people stay in business. All right. And that's the entire point of this platform that I have and that I'm building out and the people that I talk to is we're about education and we're about progress. Matt is in that 97% of that fleet that's out there. That's small business. All right. We need Matt and everybody else out there and every single one of those trucks on the road. We got to work together. We got to break down and crush these traditional fucking silos that have plagued this industry for eternity, essentially. So that's my soapbox to end for the day, Matt. How can anybody reach out to you? If there's any shippers out there watching who want some consistent reefer capacity, how can they find you? Man, I'm on LinkedIn. I will uh, post my uh, contact information below on this uh, on this chat. So, Perfect. Reach out to Matt Laird, you guys. I appreciate you guys all. Thank you all for, for chiming in the comments. You guys, again, we're live every single weekday, 8.30 a.m. Pacific, 10.30 Central. The top morning show in transportation, breaking down three industry headlines. I appreciate you guys all so much. And if you see value in this, share the show. All right. That's all I'm asking from is just share the show. This organic growth is going to come between this audience that we have out there. I appreciate you guys all so much.